Hello, my name is Rachel Miller, and today I will be talking about a novel phylogenetic approach to prioritizing HIV-1 transmission clusters. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Carr for giving me the opportunity to present, and I would also like to state that I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, I'd also like to thank and acknowledge everyone who contributed to this project, as well as the funding agencies that have provided support. Okay, so the response of public health agencies to HIV transmission is most effective when it can be focused on groups of individuals that are at elevated risk of transmitting the virus. Public health resources are limited and therefore decisions must be made about how to best allocate them. A critical element of allocating resources effectively is being able to quickly and accurately identify groups of individuals um, who are at the highest risk of transmitting. One way to identify these kinds of groups is to use phylogenetic analysis to characterize the level of divergence between viral sequences originating from different people. Uh, this is possible because viral populations are known to diverge following transmission, a phenomenon that occurs due to both HIV's rapid rate of evolution and also due to host-specific selection. So differences between viral sequences can be measured phylogenetically, by patristic distance, which is the path length between two sequences on a phylogenetic tree. Uh, that's shown here on this tree as the red lines between A and B. Um, we call infections likely to be related by recent transmission events transmission clusters, and these transmission clusters can be inferred using a patristic distance threshold uh, that will group the sequences based on their similarity. Completing analyses at a group level like this is done to maintain patient confidentiality. Additionally, it's worth noting one caveat here, which is that phylogenetic methods and measures rely upon only the sequences that have been collected at a given time and therefore cannot account for unsampled infections. So this means that branching events in a phylogeny do not represent transmission events and can never be used to definitively infer transmission between individuals. Once we identify transmission clusters, we are still left with the problem of deciding which are most important to direct public health resources towards. What's shown here is the method public health currently uses to solve that problem in British Columbia. Routine phylogenetic monitoring gives experts the chance to highlight clusters that are seen to be experiencing rapid growth within a short period of time. Additionally, Quarterly teleconferences are a chance for experts to discuss the results of the routine monitoring and raise more specific concerns that aren't covered in the daily reports. Finally, specific concerns due to the clinical circumstances of a cluster member may be raised at any point by a regional health authority. It is via these three channels that a cluster may get labeled as priority or not priority, and this labeling can change at any time. As you may be able to see, this process can be subjective and does rely on the expertise of the officials involved. For this reason, its ability to be consistent, as well as its ability to be successfully applied to new epidemics occurring in locations without a history of being studied or the existence of local experts, is reduced. One way to make the process less subjective is to introduce additional quantitative measures that can help ascertain the priority level of a cluster. Currently, it's common for experts monitoring transmission to use multiple non-phylogenetic measures, such as cluster size or the date of the most recent case to join a cluster, to guide their decision making. Although these measures are quantitative, there are no established cutoffs for when they reach a concerning level, nor are there established me methods for estimating the combined effects of multiple measures. This further demonstrates the subjectivity of and expertise required by the current methods. In this study, we aim to address this by defining a single measure that can be used to define priority and does not require expert interpretation. One such measure is lineage level diversification rate, a phylogenetically derived measure that tracks the rate at which a phylogeny diverges into new lineages, therefore serving as a proxy for transmission rate. So here, Lineages in the red area of the tree, where many new lineages are being created before they have the chance to become very genetically different, will have higher diversification rates, providing evidence for rapid transmission. The opposite is true for lineages in the blue area of the tree, 
or low diversification rates suggest slower transmission rates. In order to assess the efficacy of this measure and its ability to distinguish priority clusters, we compared it to several non-phylogenetic measures that are commonly used to determine priority clusters. To do this, we used a dataset containing 35,760 partial poll HIV sequences from nearly 10,000 patients and spanning the years 1995 to 2018. We inferred phylogenetic trees for each of these 10 years, using 100 bootstraps for each. These trees were used to infer transmission clusters and calculate lineage level diversification rates for each year. Values calculated from all bootstraps in each year were pooled to calculate diversification rate based measures, which were then compared to non phylogenetic measures. These plots show the number of clustered and unclustered cases we found in each year. Panel A shows the total number of cases in each year, and as you can see in panel B, the number of new cases decreases as the years pass, but there are still hundreds of new cases each year that could ideally be prevented if the resolution of prioritization was increased. Panel C shows the distribution of mean lineage level diversification rates measured for each cluster in 2018. Because there are very few cluster level diversification rates that are very high, the ability of this measure to select only the highest priority clusters is increased. These plots show how well a particular measure is able to separate clusters defined as priority by the current public health protocol versus those defined as not priority, specifically for the year 2018. Here we see the commonly used non-phylogenetic measures. Four out of five show a significant difference between priority and non-priority clusters, although only three out of five begin to create two well-defined peaks between the two groups of clusters. It is also worth noting that although these measures are effective, Many of them rely on data collected in previous years, which may not always be available during study of a new outbreak outside of BC that hasn't previously been followed. One of the advantages of using diversification rate-based measures is that they can be calculated using only the data available at the time. Here we see some of the diversification rate-based measures. Four out of the six shown have a significant difference between priority and non-priority clusters, and all of these create two defined peaks between the groups of clusters. This heat map summarizes the ability of all tested measures to separate priority and non-priority clusters across all 10 years. Of these, cluster growth from the previous n years, either 3 or 5, and the mean of the top five diversification rates in a cluster are the most consistently effective measures from each group. There are two main limitations that may affect the results shown in this presentation. The first is that intervention that decreases transmission can decrease the diversification rates of a transmission cluster. This means that known high priority clusters may show low diversification rates despite high potential for transmission because we already intervene heavily with these clusters. This plays a part in the second limitation, which is that the true set of clusters that should have been marked as priority in each year is not known. This means that new prioritization methods can only be evaluated in their ability to match the results of the current methods, not the true circumstances. Fortunately, both of these issues can be addressed by using simulated data. We are currently working on simulating data that will allow us to evaluate new methods in conditions where no intervention is applied and the true top priority clusters are known. Additionally, we plan to use a machine learning model, likely based in logistic regression, that will aggregate the available measures and patient data in order to even more accurately predict cluster priority while still maintaining confidentiality. In conclusion, we find that combining phylogenetic clustering with other measures can increase the resolution with which decisions about transmission cluster priority can be made further optimizing the allocation of limited resources by public health agencies. Combining phylogenetic clustering with lineage level diversification rates provides a quantitative and transferable method by which transmission clusters of urgent priority can be distinguished with comparable efficacy to non-phylogenetic measures. That concludes my talk for today. Thank you for listening.